Good morning. Welcome to Davy United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Scott Didrickson, and we are blessed and excited that you are here with us. This is the first Sunday of Lent. I know it's amazing. We are on our way to Easter. Time flies, doesn't it? Amen. So a few announcements as we get started. First, let, let us read together the vision statement for the church. Here at Davy United Methodist Church, God is transforming lives through sharing the promise and hope of God's love. Amen? So it's the first Sunday of Lent, so that means that we are in the process of getting ready for Easter. Next week is the blood truck, the blood mobile will be here. So if you're able to give blood, that's a great, great, great way to help others is to give blood. So that'll be next Sunday during the worship service. We are also having our small group Wednesday night Bible study every Wednesday in Bregan Hall at 7 p.m. If you are unable to come or if you're watching online and you want to be a part of it, please contact the office and we'll get you a Zoom link so you can be part of the Bible study. I think finally last week we were able to get the technical issues fixed, so it actually worked for those that were watching online to be a part of the Bible study. It's a little bit more technically difficult than just regular Zoom, but it's working out good, so that's a great way to come closer to God and come closer to other people in relationship as well. And remember that we are doing a push online through our streaming, Facebook, YouTube, and our website. So if you're watching online right now, we ask you to like and comment and share the video, even if it's just to say, I'm here worshiping God. These are ways that the way that the algorithm works on Facebook, especially the more that that happens, the more people will see the video. We are also boosting these videos. So if throughout the week you see the video pop up on your timeline, please like, share, comment on it. And then do this on our website and the YouTube page as well. Subscribe to the YouTube page, David United Methodist Church, and give a thumbs up, comment on the videos. These are all ways so that the videos will be presented to people in our community on their timelines. They'll see it and be invited into relationship with God through it. Amen? So let us begin worship with a word of prayer. Good morning. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you have made yourself known, but in a most amazing way. Coming in weakness, in a tiny baby, you covered your glory and hid your greatness. God of mystery and surprise, we praise you. God, you have made yourself known, but in a most amazing way. Born to be humble, working people, hidden in a simple life, and yet announced in the stars of heaven and visited by kings. God of mystery and surprise, we praise you. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Come all ye weary, come all you thirsty, Come of the well that will never run dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come God with mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the feet of the cross. Jesus is waiting with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son that only forgave us whoever believes in him 
Just raise your hearts to Him.
your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Beautiful. Please stand as you are able for the reading of Word of God. Psalm chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake. O Lord, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Please be seated.
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Amen. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the word of God. Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I established my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Please be seated. So as we go into our time of prayer, we want to especially remember the Rue family. They normally would have sat right back there on the left-hand side, Connie and Bill. For those of you who don't know, Connie, over the last two years as they've been attending this church, has been going through chemo for cancer. They kept it private. They didn't tell very many people, but some knew, and we were praying for her. And she seemed like she was doing pretty well. She was here. Both of them were here a few weeks ago, and she seemed very energetic and happy. She had a big smile on her face. But then within a week, she had passed. She went to visit a friend, and um, she fainted, went to the hospital, and never recovered. So today, we are remembering them. We're keeping Bill and the rest of their family in our prayers. We lit a candle on the altar for Connie, but make sure that you are um, praying for them. I talked to Bill, and he's... He's actually very upbeat. He said he'll be back in just a few weeks. He just needed to, to get his feet underneath him again. So keep them in your prayers. We are also praying for Hollywood Community Church as each week we, we pray for other churches in our community. And this week we're praying for Hollywood Community and Senior Pastor Brian Burkholder. Pastor Burkholder asks us to pray for their food pantry, that they are able to continue to feed the people in their community, and also for the health of the congregation and for wisdom for their pastors. So let us go to God in prayer. Loving, creating God. You are in covenant with your people. 
you have pledged to be our God and ask us to be your people. Trusting you in all of our ways and our lives. But God, we find ourselves making excuses. Excuses to prevent us from really trusting you. We erect barriers. We build walls before our faith journey even begins. We give lip service to the journey. We daydream about what it would be like to truly place our lives in your hands and to follow you in everything that we do. But when it actually comes down to it, we focus on our time constraints and our commitments to other things, to other endeavors. We build the wall between us, brick by brick. Help us to tear down the barriers that have existed between us since the beginning of time, since we chose to live against you, when we choose the world over you, when we choose ourselves over you. Make us ready for the journey by replacing the fear in our hearts with a sense of joy and challenge of self-discovery and discipleship. Remind us that in service to you by helping others, we will also find ourselves made fully whole, brought closer to you. We come before you at this time with Hurts, hurts for ourselves and hurts for our loved ones, friends, family, co-workers. In this room, there is a list longer than we could speak of those that need prayers right now. Those that are struggling with sickness, illness, depression, loss. We ask you to pour your Holy Spirit upon them, upon each of us. Give us healing. Give us hope. Surround us with loved ones that lift us up and give us that little bit to just carry on in the darkest moment. Make us ready, each one of us, ready to receive your good news and then to be witnesses to your love for all of your people. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we close together, praying the prayer that your son taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony Of liberty 
Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has taught us facing the rising sun of the new days begun let us march on till victory is won. Stony the hill till victory is won. Stony the road we trod be Chesting rod, fill in the dead that hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place on which our father sighed. We have come over the way that the tears have been watered. We have come trending our path the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stay at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might lead us into the light keep us forever on the path we pray least our feet stray from the places our God where we meet thee least our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath the hand may we forgive the stand true to our God true to our native land true to our God true to our native land
Amen. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the words of God. This is from the third chapter, first book of Peter, starting at verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Oh God, please, we come to you. We beseech you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us today, those in this building, those listening on the internet, those in this community, the entire world. Pour your Holy Spirit out and transform us. Bring us close to you, God. Let us see you and experience you in a deep and fulfilling and life-changing way. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, in probably the history of movies, the Western dominated in the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s. They made more Western movies then you could probably count. There were movies dominated by legends like John Wayne. And a lot of us grew up with those. But for those of us who are younger generations, movies disappeared in the 70s and 80s. Movies, the Westerns, became kind of a joke at the end because they were all the same. There was the good guy and the bad guy, and the good guy almost always prevailed at the end. So movies kind of disappeared for a while, but then in 1992, one of the great actors of the earlier period of Westerns directed a movie that ended up being one of the greatest Westerns in the history of Westerns, and for those of you who can remember, that was The Unforgiven, directed and starred by Clint Eastwood. And now we remember Clint, we see Clint, and he's a much elderly man at this time, but that movie was amazing. And it's still a classic to this day. And it had a great cast. Morgan Freeman was his buddy. Gene Hackman was the sheriff. And even the late Richard... Um, f totally forgot his name. Harris. Richard Harris was in there too. Great actor, great cast. It was an amazing movie. And that movie flipped everything on its head. The westerns before of the good sheriff coming up against the bad band of guys and overcoming drastic odds against them, was turned upside down. In this movie, the bad guys became the good guys, and the good guys became the bad guys. And at the end of the movie, we have this classic showdown between Clint and Gene Hackman, their characters. And they're in the saloon, and Clint comes in. They had the body of Morgan Freeman out on the, the porch of the saloon, and... Clint Eastwood's character came in, and he was furious of what they did to his friend. And he came in, and he shot down Gene Hackman's character. And as Gene Hackman's character laid on the ground dying, he started to really wail about how 
wrong this whole thing was. He was saying that he was a good person and he deserved better. He was building a house and he didn't deserve any of this that had happened to him. And Clint Eastwood, again with an iconic line, says, deserves, got nothing to do with it. And in this moment, the Gene Hackman character was really, even though they didn't say this, was really talking about this concept of karma. Now, here in the West, we have really let, or karma has become part of our culture. You may have even talked about it or said when you've seen something bad or good happen to a bad or good person, well, they finally got their karma. And it's usually talking about bad people who get what we think is coming to them. So it's interesting, as I was thinking and, and preparing for this sermon, I started to go online and I was reading about karma stories, and we all do this. I went on Google and I Googled stories about karma, and I started reading all of these stories about karma, and I realized that most of the stories got it wrong, get it wrong. And our idea of karma in the West is actually wrong. For you see, karma is not a result. Karma in Hinduism and Buddhism, and they have different opinions of what karma really is between those two belief systems, but to them, it's an action. Karma literally means action. It's the idea that if you do good in your life, there's a force, karma, that is going to lead you to good results. What we call karma in the West is actually the fruits of the action of karma. So when we think of, well, they got their karma, that's not actually how it works. It's really that there's, a, there's an action that, a cause that actually leads to the result. It's a cause and effect situation. If you do good, you're going to get good. If you do bad, you're going to get bad. So as I was reading these different stories, and some of them were very funny, some of them were pretty dark. These stories of what people believe karma is, on the internet, I realized that most of us have no idea what karma is. And we really get it wrong even in our stories or our thoughts of karma. And so I'm going to give you a few examples. One is this. The, that classic example of the teenager riding the school bus and the bully booting them out of the seat. There's this one story, and there's multiple variations of these stories. So this one young person got booted out of the seat, was very ashamed because they didn't stand up for themselves, but they were afraid of the bully beating them up. And so the person waited and carried their cell phone with their video camera everywhere they went and watched that bully intently. And when they finally saw the bully doing something illegal, videoed the bully, then created a fake email account and sent the email with the video to the school board and the administration of the school and got the bully expelled from school. And the, the young person was able to ride the bus in peace the rest of their time in school. Not karma, probably revenge. Not the same thing. If you are making karma happen, that's not karma. Another instance is a young child, maybe the age of eight or 10, is at the airport with their parents and got a big meal at the restaurant before they went to the gate and wasn't able to eat all their food and they had a basket of fries left over, saw a woman sitting next to them who had no food at all, and so the child very kindly gave the woman their french fries. This was pre-COVID. The woman ate the french fries, was very happy and thankful. Then when they went to get on their plane and went to the gate, it turned out the woman they gave the french fries to was the person working the gate. They got a free upgrade to business class. Again, not karma. If you're nice to people, usually they're nice to you back, just the way the world works. Again, if you're putting yourself in the action, 
That's not really karma. Third example, which might be the closest to karma, but I'm still not sure. You'll have to think about it and tell me what you think. So a person was at a red light, the car in front of them, the driver got out. This is a rage road, uh, road rage incident. Got out, went to the car in front of him, started screaming and knocking on the window, screaming at the person. When the light changed green, the guy was in mid-scream, ran back to his car to make the green light, realized he'd locked himself in. The automatic locks went off on the car. Might be karma, might be not knowing how to operate your vehicle correctly. Could be karma, you'll have to help me with this. The good thing about all of this is guess what? As Christians, we don't believe in karma. Karma is not Christianity. Because we understand as Christians that just because we do good things doesn't mean good things are going to happen to us. First of all, we all know good people that have had terrible things happen to them. Wonderful children that are perfect that get cancer. If karma was real, that would never happen. But a more deeper understanding is what we read here in 1 Peter. And the author of this scripture would actually agree with Clint Eastwood's character in The Unforgiven over Gene Hackman's character. Deserves got nothing to do with it. The truth is, and I don't mean to burst anybody's balloon, but if you do good in this world, especially in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, the world is going to hate you. The world is going to want to punish you for doing what's right. Because the world is not interested in doing what's right, especially in the name of Jesus to glorify God. The world teaches us that this is about us. This is about what we deserve, what we need to get out of the world. And if we do good, we'll get good. If we do bad, we're going to get bad. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't do good. We're supposed to do good. But don't expect that everything in your life is going to be rosy because of it. The author here in 1 Peter is actually telling us the opposite. The author here is telling us that as Christians, we are going to suffer for our belief system. Guess what? Jesus Christ suffered. God suffered for us so that we could be brought into relationship with God, that we could be saved from our sin. Jesus suffered for us. This concept of the suffering servant dates, goes back to the Old Testament. We find it throughout the book of Isaiah and the other prophets. And we see it through the Gospels. We see it through the, the letters and this letter from 1 Peter. That God suffered for us so that sin and death could be overcome. And that as we, as Christians, love God and in our response to what God did for us, we are probably going to suffer in our life as well. God did not create suffering. God is not trying to make us suffer. The world is broken. We live in a broken, sinful world that is going to make us all feel it. And it's going to be painful at different times. The question is, how do we respond to that suffering? And I believe that God is going to bless us, even through the suffering, as we believe and as we live in relationship with God. There are going to be beautiful times in our life. There's going to be difficult times in our life. The question is, how do we respond to those difficult moments? Do we throw up our hands and say, woe is me, woe is me. God, why are you doing this to me? Or do we say, 
even in this moment, God is great. I know God's plan, even in this time, is for good. That God is going to use even my suffering in this moment for good in this world. Maybe I can't see it right now. Maybe I can't feel it. Maybe it's too dark. But if I just have faith, if I just believe and love God, even in the dark moment, there is going to be beauty in the end. This is what this moment of Lent is about. For us believers, this is about giving up things and suffering a little bit. And do not even think for a second that you're suffering even in the most difficult, challenging times. And I know some of you are going through it right now or have gone through it in the past. You're losing loved ones. You're losing wives and husbands and children. There is cancer. There is death. There is pain and loss in your life, but do not think for a second that your suffering compares to what Jesus went through on the cross, because it doesn't. Most of our suffering is things that we have to go through in our own life, but we're not doing it for other people. Sometimes, but most of the time, it's because we're just in a rough spot, and the things that we love are being taken away from us. Jesus went to the cross for us, too. Jesus didn't do it for Jesus himself. Jesus did it for you and me. Jesus' suffering was pure. And so this time in Lent, we are just trying to, in a little insignificant way, mirror what Jesus did for us. Jesus gave up everything for us. Are we willing to give even a little bit of our own selfishness up for God? And do we do it in a way that glorifies God and doesn't glorify ourselves? How often do you hear other people say, well, I'm giving up this for Lynn, I'm giving up that for Lynn, it was really hard, but I did it. No, they didn't. God did it. We're not doing it through our own strength, we're doing it through the strength of God, we're doing it because of God, and we want God to get the glory, or that's at least what we're supposed to be doing. And when we're going through difficult times in our lives, and please do not think that I'm minimizing the pain that some of you are going through. But the truth is, do we do it in a way that glorifies God or that glorifies ourselves? Do we do it in a way that shows other people, wow, that person's really going through a nightmare right now, but they are doing it in a way They've got something that I don't have. I couldn't do it the way they're doing it. I would be a total train wreck. They have so much love, even in the moment. The darkest moment, they're loving others. They're lifting other people up. They're bringing light to the world, even in the darkest time. That's what we're called to as Christians. Lent is just a moment and a time for us to really practice it in a way that doesn't hurt us that bad. And yeah, if you want to give up something for Lent, awesome. If you've already figured that out, great. But if you haven't, maybe Lent might be about something a little different this year. Maybe it's about changing the way we treat other people. That we're going to treat other people better than we did before. That we're going to love people just a little bit more than we love them in our normal day-to-day life. And then when Lent's over, don't go back. Don't go back to the old way. Do it the rest of your life. And then maybe next year, you take a little bit more of a step. And you do that every year. And it becomes part of who you are. It becomes your DNA. And it transforms not just you, but it transforms everybody around you and all the relationships around you. And it transforms the world through that. Amen?
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, God, and we praise you. You are an awesome God. You pour out blessings upon us that we do not deserve. Give us the courage to let that love and grace change us and make us into who you are calling us to be. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as you go forth, the ushers are going to come up and direct us out. As you go out, there are plates for your tithe, gifts, and offerings. We thank you for that. If you're watching online, go to our website, davidumc.com, and there's an orange giving button about halfway down that you can give as well. I know that God is going to bless you through your giving. Walk in light and truth. See the light of Christ in every face. Be the light of Christ to all that you meet. Change the world. God bless you and amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.